Good morning. Please take a seat. Good morning, everybody. My name is Gemma Green. I am the chair for this third plenary session, which is called the Underground Shift. Um, in this discussion, we'll be looking at the uh, how corporates are handling stranded asset risk in their businesses, and also Australian resource uh, companies' relationship with key export markets on um, investor assets. Uh, unless you've been living under a rock, you couldn't help but notice that uh, stranded assets have become very much a part of a mainstream conversation. Uh, yesterday, the head of the IEA Faith Bureau said there is a five-year deadline to prove clean coal technologies are commercially viable. And last week, the Bank of England's governor, um, Mark Carney, said that between one-third and one-fifth of the world's fossil fuel reserves that are proven today will need to stay in the ground um, if we're to stick within a two-degree temperature rise limit. Uh, we'll start today's session with a very short video from someone that's not uh, here in the flesh. That's Dr. Timo Gould. He's the Director of Global Energy Economics from the IEA. And he'll be talking about which fossil fuel assets are most at risk of becoming stranded in a two degree world. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Timo Gould. Um, from the International Energy Agency in Paris. Uh, it is a great privilege uh, to address this distinguished audience today at the IGCC's Climate Change Summit. I regret very much I cannot be with you today, but would like to provide you with some background on the IEA's analysis with regards to stranded assets in the energy sector. The energy sector has always devoted considerable resources to finding and then proving up fossil fuel reserves in the expectation that they will one day be commercialized. The extent to which these reserves are consumed and the CO2 emissions released differs by fuel and the policy environment according to the nature and intensity of the climate policies adopted. We have looked at the amount of fossil fuel reserves that remain underground in more detail. Under current trends, we use half of our proven fossil fuel reserves until 2050, as you see here. This is of course different by fuel. While we develop three quarters of proven oil and 80% of proven gas reserves, two thirds of coal reserves, which are obviously much larger, stay underground. Pursuing climate uh, action, much more stringent climate action in the attempt to meet the two degrees target means that more than two thirds of current proven fossil fuel reserves are not commercialized before 2050, unless of course CCS gets much more widely deployed. This means that more than 50% of the oil and gas reserves get developed and consumed, but only 20% of today's coal reserves. Looking a little more closely at um, proven oil and gas reserves, um, we have to say that already Today, 30% are already producing. In a two degrees world, we are roughly looking at developing another 20% of these reserves over the next 20 years, which is um, a little lower than we would otherwise do under current trends. In our projections, no oil or gas field currently in production would need to shut down prematurely. Some fields yet to start production are not developed before um, 2035, meaning that these proven oil and gas reserves do not start to recover their exploration costs in this time frame. But of course, most of them are also not developed under current trends. This does not mean that we can sit back and relax, of course, but it means that we need to carefully anticipate climate policy in order to limit the amount of assets stranded to the extent possible and minimize the economic damage. Uh, because all of this obviously can uh, come at a cost. One can, of course, always discuss about the definitions of stranded assets in this kind of context. But in our analysis, the amount of fossil fuels stranded under a two degrees trajectory amounts to around $180 billion until 2035, with an additional $120 billion in the power sector and others occurring elsewhere, probably in LNG infrastructure, for example. Now, Talking about climate 
public policy and stranded assets, I think begs the question, how serious do we think do we need to take climate policy at all? As you know, countries are currently making their pledges towards COP21, which will take place in Paris in just a few weeks of time. We at the International Energy Agency have analyzed these pledges, and at other institutions as well, we found that they alone will not be sufficient yet to meet the two degrees target. But the political will that is expressed through these um, climate ple pledges is very considerable. As you can see here, by the 2nd of October, almost 150 countries uh, around the world have expressed their plans to address climate change to the UNFCCC. We are currently working to update our analysis of these pledges and what they mean for the energy sector and will release this update in about two weeks from now. But it is clear that the energy sector transformation is already on its way in many parts of the world and I would like to give you a couple of indicators for that just looking um, back at the year 2015 where renewable uh, additions in the power sector were at a record high where energy intensity declined at twice the rate of that of the last decade and um, already around 11% of energy related emissions are covered by carbon markets. Now, let me conclude my brief uh, intervention here with a couple of final thoughts. First of all, these pledges, as I just said, towards COP21 are not yet enough to achieve our climate goal, but they are and they will be an, a basis from which to build increasing ambition over time. When we talk about uh, stranded assets, not all proven reserves can be used under a two degrees uh, trajectory when it comes to fossil fuels, of course. But uh, we should also keep in mind that even under current trends, some may stay underground for a long time to come. I would also like to bring to the uh, attention of um, the panel and the audience in general two other thoughts. First of all, it is not uh, the two degrees target alone that may or may not change energy markets. For example, um, Australia is a big coal exporter and uh, many of Australia's key export markets are increasingly grappling with air pollution, limiting potentially in the future the use of coal. We should also always keep in mind that changes in technology and uh, changes in the policy landscape are part of the energy business. And um, it would be very interesting from my point of view to um, discuss what makes climate policy different from normal market risks. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a fruitful discussion uh, on these kind of points. We have a very esteemed panel um, to uh, discuss stranded asset risk with us this morning. Our first speaker is Volker Beckers, and he's the former CEO of RWE Power, which is one of the largest utilities in Europe. Uh, he's now um, on the, the board of at least a dozen um, different companies. I won't go through all of them, but today what he's going to talk, talk about are the, the lessons that Australia could draw from Europe in terms of what not to do, and uh, also looking at the trend towards more decentralised energy systems, and finally, what are the costs in terms of upgrading energy infrastructure for the 21st century? Please join me in welcoming Volker Beckers. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Gemma. Um, this day holds so many surprises for me. The first surprise this morning was that I was in a sandwich position speaking between two politicians from Australia. The second one is I'm speaking after the German from the IEA. Um, and, uh, and, and the third one is uh, that I'm seeing uh, the slides I'm presenting to you and all the first time as well. So, uh, <laughs> so, <coughs> so please join me in, in, in surprising you. Um, but at least you still have some humor. That is really good at this time of the day. Right, let me just start with, um, <laughs> I knew it was not going to work. Uh, can you just advance the slides, please? Um, right. I keep saying this one is an accident. Um, and um, and I, I mentioned this uh, this morning. Um, wh why has Europe got to this position? Well, you could say basically um, because um, the way how renewables was subsidized and so it is being subsidized uh, is just um, exceptional. 
And, and I come back to what that means uh, in terms of the uh, uh, total size um, of, the, of the bill. So again, this clicker doesn't work, so if you just advance to the next one. You, you have a look at the, uh, the investments uh, Europe has um, undertaken uh, so far um, in the last decade. Um, and that um, adds up to three trillion dollars, which you would see if the person behind the scene is clicking it again for me, please. Um, and and the, the amount to be investments uh, to be invested. Looking at the, the figures, uh, Timor Gül just uh, presented um, will add another eight trillion uh, U.S. dollars. So I, I keep saying. Uh, for a country like the UK, uh, where I've been uh, chief executive for, for the last 10 years, that means hosting the, uh, is it not working? Thank you. Um, uh, hosting the Olympic uh, uh, Games every year twice for the next 25 years. For some people, that means, oh my God. Um, uh, but it tells you what, what the size um, uh, of the investment is. Um, but it certainly means um, that we need a framework which is more than just political um, uh, will and intention. And I have heard about this um, um, uh, over the last 24 hours, quite a lot actually, very positive rhetoric. But it's about how sustainable are these um, objectives and, and will they change if uh, consumers, taxpayers, all of a sudden realize that some of that costs will land on their tax or on their energy bill, and that's the experience uh, we have made in, uh, in Europe. So let me just um, show you uh, very briefly um, what happened to, uh, to the incumbent players. Um, this is the market cap of the 10 biggest uh, companies, minus uh, there as well, and had a fair slice um, in 2008. Um, in fact, we had a market cap of around um, 65 billion, company is now worth uh, only 12% of that amount. Um, and, and then you see where uh, it, it got to. Effectively, uh, within the last years, this is until 2013, not today, um, the European market lost about 50% of its market um, cap. And uh, uh, many say, well, that's due to shale gas, um, uh, cheap energy and renewables, but actually, it is predominantly due to political uncertainty um, we, we have found uh, the market to be in. And, and I want to um, um, cover this in, in a different slide so that you see uh, where, where the regions are most exposed to. Um, and I know I have only a few minutes, so uh, let me just summarize what I believe uh, that the main learnings from um, the, the European development uh, were. One is we wanted to do the transition uh, as a first mover as quickly as possible and therefore put all policy changes in, in a melting pot and try to achieve everything in, in the shortest time. I think that has created 28 different energy policies and uh, not coordinated. So incremental approach is absolutely key. The second one is not a, not a single policy um, was based on economic efficiency. Um, that's been introduced in some governments across Europe. So it's effectively a benefit testing program. Whatever they want to do, they test before they implement this. I think that's important for this country here as well. Thirdly, that um, not only generation, but demand and supply measures get equally considered. Again, something I'm dearly missing. Um, and then the fourth one is if if incumbents, if energy companies, large energy companies do want to change, that politicians create the certainty in, in, a, in a framework which doesn't expose them from one day to another, as we have seen in Germany where nuclear power plants had to be switched off within weeks, not months, not years, within weeks. I want to stop here and, and get my, my tension a bit down uh, to answer your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Volker. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Fiona Wild. Um, she's the Vice President of Environment and Climate Change from BHP Billiton. 
Um, she'll be talking about BHP's Climate Change Portfolio Analysis Report, which was released earlier this month, and it's a very exciting report, probably the most sophisticated analysis that's been done from a resources company looking at climate change risk in the portfolio. Please join me in welcoming Fiona. surprises for me. Let's see if this still works. Um, my name is Fiona Wild, I'm Vice President of Environment and Climate Change for BHP Bilton and as Gemma mentioned the timing of this discussion is perfect for us because last week we launched our climate change portfolio analysis and I have many copies available if you would like it. Um, and what this does is it explains how the company could continue to create shareholder value in the transition to a two degree C world. The document is quite detailed, um, and I've only got five minutes today, so I won't cover everything, but if you would like to know more, I'd be really happy to talk to you after the session. So before we commence, I will show you the obligatory disclaimer in extraordinarily small font, if you can read this and take it all into consideration. I'll move on to the next slide, <laughs> which is uh, an introduction, if you like, to the portfolio analysis. We think this is a really important piece of work. What it does is it provides greater detail on our scenario planning process that we use at BHP Billiton. It describes how the two degree transition impacts the portfolio and the individual commodities, and also explains why we think our portfolio will be resilient in that scenario. We think that detailed disclosure like this not only informs investors, but it also supports the companies that manage this change most effectively. It presents our current view of the world, and we'll continue to adapt and optimise into the future, as we have done in the past. So our planning process starts with a central case, which we build through an extensive analysis of commodity markets, the global economy, and then benchmark against external views, including the IEA. Whilst our forecast of what we expect to happen we also recognise that it's subject to uncertainty and the world could move in different ways. So we use scenario analysis to understand how external factors like economic policy and technology trends could impact our business. These scenarios aren't forecasts and they're designed to be plausible, divergent and internally consistent. We also develop a range of signposts and triggers to help us indicate which way the path may be proceeding, which path the world may be proceeding down. So in the portfolio analysis, we outline four scenarios that we use to summarise different ways the world could evolve beyond our central case. These scenarios are not our preferred or more likely outcomes, and we seek to be directionally robust rather than accurate in these predictions. It's really important to note that climate change occurs in all the scenarios, but what difference is the global response to climate change. We also include a price on carbon in all the scenarios, and we've done so for some time in internal valuations. The global accord scenario, which is the one over on the right, is where I will focus today, and that's the focus of this report. It models a reduction in global emissions to get the world on a path to two degrees after 2030. So a bit of description about this global accord scenario. We see robust economic growth in this scenario and unified action to address climate change. Breakthroughs in low emissions and renewables technologies along with a really strong consumer pull for green products and services enable an orderly transition to a two degree world. But we also stress test our portfolio against what we call a shock event, a much more unlikely or extreme event, a more rapid version of global accord, with a two degree path reached by 2030, driven by much stronger government targets and significant technology developments. We then run very detailed modeling for each of our commodities. Demand is driven by major economic activity and determined by bottom-up modelling of China and India, global GDP forecasts, plus specific developments by commodity, including substitution, shifts in imports and exports, and domestic production. This last slide shows the impacts on demand for our commodities in a two degree C world. It does have three axes on it, so I will just run through it for you. 
The 100% line in the middle indicates the long-term demand at 2030 for our commodities in the central case. The blue dots indicate current demand for each commodity, so demand in 2014 for each commodity. And the orange box indicates the range in demand for each commodity from the orderly global accord scenario to the rapid shock event. And what you can see here is that demand continues to grow for most commodities in both the global accord scenario and the shock event. And that relative to the central case, there are winners and losers. Oil and energy coal are most impacted. Copper, uranium, and US gas do very well, along with high quality resources in iron ore and metallurgical coal. Potash is down slightly on the central case, but with good growth from today. In this chart, you can see the expected growth in EBITDA in our central case, doubling in real terms to 2030, the two blue bars. We then run the global accord scenario with the changes in demand, carbon and commodity prices. And you can see the impact on EBITDA is quite small for such a long range forecast. We also then run the shock event with a higher carbon price than under the global accord scenario and again, you can see a relatively small impact on EBITDA. That's the two orange bars. So the question is, why? Well, it's driven by our strategy of diversification. Low cost, high quality assets, and projects which generate strong returns, even in a two degree world. And we will, of course, continue to optimize through selective and disciplined investment decisions to improve these outcomes. So in conclusion, we recognise the importance of transparency in helping shareholders understand how we manage climate risk. In general, the most efficient producers in growth markets will do best in a well-managed transition to a two-degree world. We believe we will continue to create shareholder value for shareholders in both this scenario and the shock event. The demand for most of our products will continue to rise. And our commodity diversification the low cost and high quality of our resources and growth options minimises the risk of stranded assets. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Um, next we'll hear from Mark Rogers, who is the Director of Direct Infrastructure at Colonial First State Global Asset Management, and he'll be talking about partially stranded assets mitigation costs and how to build resilience into infrastructure. Please join me in welcoming Mark. Thanks, Sam. I, uh, apologies for the lack of slides. I just flown back in from London, so I could actually be the first conference speaker to put myself to sleep. So if you <laughs> give me a nice general if I'm starting to off a little bit. Um, it's a really good time to be talking about this. I've just come back from a couple of board meetings and some regulated utilities over in the UK. And this conversation is actually very active in those assets. So I want to sort of introduce a, not probably a new concept, but a slightly different concept of partially stranded assets. Because there's been a lot of focus on assets that are intensive in carbon or produce a lot of carbon, and as a result, they're going to be affected by policy. But Colonial First State is a big investor in direct infrastructure, so we own, on behalf of our clients, direct stakes in critical pieces of infrastructure that provide critical services to communities. Now, these assets are going to be significantly affected by the 2 degree, 4 degree, 6 degree, whatever climate outcome we get to, and there's absolutely no doubt that we're going to get to a different climate outcome. And we need to start understanding at our board governance level what of those assets can be partially stranded. So I'll talk a little bit about that, and then I'll ask the question about who's going to pay for it, because uh, we don't turn up for free, unfortunately. We need our pittance for delivering our capital to um, provide the... The, uh, the growth in these assets as communities grow. I'll give you two examples. Um, we own a water company in the UK called Anglian Water. It's in the biggest region geographically in the UK. It's a nine and a half billion dollar business. It's a big business. It provides water and wastewater services to a, a large um, group of people in the uh, east part of the UK. It also sits in a region where on any one day you can have drought and flood in the same region. So in the north part usually one, and in the south part normally the other. And as temperature changes and those drought and flood events change also, probably more frequently, 
we need to start understanding what the existing infrastructure can do to mitigate the impacts of that change. And in essence, they can't. Those, those assets effectively become partially stranded. They're still useful, they still deliver a service, but in, as these events become more frequent in those events, they start to not do their job so well. So we start having a conversation with the government about moving water from the north to the south because we've got a lot of water in the north and we've got no water in the south. The government then turns around and says, well, who's going to pay for that? And of course, it's our customers. And so the conversation then becomes, well, what information are you basing this on? Because we know you as a capital-hungry business who wants to put money to work might be trying to say, we need to gold plate these assets. And the government obviously doesn't want to gold plate the assets and certainly haven't given us provision to do that in the current regulatory review. So we then start to have a little bit of a conversation with the government, um, call it an argument if you will, about who's right and who's wrong on the information that's presented on climate change and what it's going to mean for our assets. These are effectively 100 year assets, massively long life assets that we have to try and get our heads around. And so we're doing that now, we're having a conversation with the government. We started, um, this, Australia's a good uh, proposition to this too with our desalinisation plants that we've never turned on. We started having a conversation with the government about building this pipeline and we got provision to actually build the pipeline and we actually turned, put people on hose pipe vans so people at their houses couldn't use hoses for their washing their cars and gardens and all those sort of bits and pieces. And we started the first point of construction of this pipeline and as happened in Australia ever since that day, it's rained very hard everywhere. <laughs> and so this asset became, I guess, partially stranded. Was it actually needed? Um, was it an expensive insurance policy? Who's paying for it and are they angry about it? Is that capital that could have gone somewhere else? Um, and how does that conversation come together the next time we actually try and convince the government that we need to build a pipeline or a reservoir or a dam somewhere for some purpose that actually may not eventually? <coughs> so we're in a very difficult position at the moment and I think from our perspective it's all about information and having a, a complete sort of congruence of that information into one point so that everyone understands that there's a common knowledge around all of these sort of bits and pieces. The other example a little closer to home is uh, Brisbane Airport. Um, is currently building a second runway, has started that process. Uh, very interesting conversation that the board of Brisbane Airport had. One of my colleagues sits on the board there, we own about 25% of Brisbane Airport. They actually formed a subcommittee of that board to talk about um, what that runway needed to look like, because as you know, Queensland flooded well, not once, but twice, and I think they were both one in 100 year floods, so someone sort of didn't get that maths right. And the board had to actually consider, and in those floods, both of those events, I guess what they call single jeopardy events, so they only had the flood and of course Brisbane Airport sits on Moreton Bay and the water runs straight out of, uh, off the airport into Moreton Bay, that was wonderful, we didn't lose a single hour of operation. Now had those same floods occurred on a day where we had a king tide or a storm surge, probably not the same outcome, really, and I think we're all aware of what happens at a major airport when it's not operating for an hour or two or five or a day or two or three. And so the subcommittee then went through a process of considering all of the information that was on the table that all of these smart people here have you know, helped develop and put together you know, with the UN and a whole bunch of bits and pieces and actually tried to make a decision about how high that runway needed to be. Because it's an airport in the swamp on the bay. So it's a bit of a stupid place to put an airport, to be quite honest. <laughs> but we're stuck with that and we don't want it to be partially stranded. We want this thing to be operating every hour of every day that we want it to operate because it's a critical piece of infrastructure that provides critical services to our community. And so then we got into a very interesting conversation because who pays for it? If we raise the runway half a metre, we're talking about maybe another $100 million spent in a $1.3 billion project. Don't quote me on those numbers, I'm not a fan of them, but that's about right. Massive, we're talking massive amounts of capital um, to get a slightly different outcome. And then we talk, turn around and talk to the airlines, or actually or the users, yourselves in essence, the airlines representing the users, and they say, well, you know, A, the second runway is going to be empty for 30 years because it's excess capacity that you're building there. So there's a normal business conversation that goes on around whether you need a runway or not and what, when you need a runway. Then we start to say, well, it's actually going to cost 20% more than we thought. Because we've looked at the numbers and we think we need to build this runway maybe a metre higher so that we can have an airport that's not partially stranded during these changed climates, climate events. And then we have to convince the airlines who are paying for this thing in advance that it's the right time to start charging their customers for this piece of infrastructure because the users effectively pay and that increases the cost of the plane ticket. And so it's a really interesting, messy conversation. Um, I don't even think I have time to really start the conversation about insurance, but in essence what we're trying to do as critical infrastructure providers is stop our assets becoming partially stranded. They're always going to be there, they're critical infrastructure. They're not these assets like um, coal-fired power generation that at a certain point in time will turn off. 
Brisbane Airport, I can pretty much guarantee, will be there for the next 100 or so years. We're trying to work hard to make sure that Brisbane Airport doesn't become partially stranded based on uh, the climate outcome that we're facing over the next 50 or 100 years. So I might leave it there. Finally, we um, will hear from Tim Buckley, who is the Director of Energy Finance Studies in Australasia for the Institute of Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. We'll be hearing about the coal outlook in India and China and what that means for Australia, as well as uh, a look at Glencore. Thank you. Good morning. Right. Um, I study the risks for Australia of stranded assets, and in particular in the export coal industry, but also, and probably more importantly, for the associated rail and port infrastructure assets that are associated with those potentially stranded coal mines. This stranded asset risk relates to the faster than expected transformation of key electricity markets. And the, those electricity markets, China and India in particular, are the key sources of import demand growth for thermal coal that Australia is relying on. The transformation of China's electricity market is critical for Australia. The 38% reduction in coal imports in the first half of 2015 was massively underestimated by the financial markets, and yet it's also only the start. That has huge implications for Australia. Professors Chi and Go yesterday talked about peak coal in China, and I 100% concur with their conclusion. We are past that point already. What gets me very excited, though, is the increasing evidence that India is not only looking to replicate China's transformation, but they're also being successful in their pursuit of that goal. To me, to exit 2015, where the three largest economies, the three largest consumers of coal, the three largest electricity markets in the world, China, America and India, are all moving forward to transition, is cause for cautious optimism. On China, I won't dwell on it, given we've already touched on it at length yesterday, but it's highly likely that China, that history will show Chinese coal production, Chinese coal consumption, and Chinese coal imports peaked in 2013. Let me just point out a statistical aberration in BP's World Energy Yearbook for 2015 that relates to China. BP reports that Chinese coal production dropped 2.6% last year. We know imports dropped 11%, but the aberration is that BP managed to report that Chinese coal consumption increased by 0.1%. China's coal, coal is China, China's half the world's coal. So if that error or statistical aberration was reversed, rather than saying coal consumption globally last year rose by 0.4, which was what BP concluded, you actually end up with a decline of 1% globally. Why is that relevant? In financial markets, tipping points are really, really hard to forecast. And if the data's wrong, you're probably gonna miss it. Now, if the world peaked in 2013, coal consumption globally declined 1% last year, it's on track to decline more than 3% this year. In other words, we're past the peak globally as well as in China. To move on to India, the world's second largest coal consumer. Energy Minister Goyal has articulated a comprehensive plan to transform India's electricity markets. He's 18 months into the job and he's hitting goals every week. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of those before I'll announce what his plan is. The existing energy system that he inherited was performing so poorly the degree of scepticism I get in uh, talking about success is very, very high for India. However, if you put it the other way around, and that's how Energy Minister Goya talks, the opportunities are very, very high, even with basic improvements in the system. The system's so bad, any improvement can actually have profound changes. 
And that's what I'm seeing the initial evidence for. His plans articulated there, or well, my summary of it, 175 gigawatts of renewable by 2022, $200 billion of investment. I'll come back to that. Secondly, $50 billion for grid upgrades, grid efficiency upgrades, and thirdly, a doubling of the low-cost domestic Indian coal production by 2022 to 1.5 billion tonnes. Combination is a key risk for Australia, a key opportunity for India. That is the cessation of thermal coal imports into India as Energy Minister Goyal's target. Now, what gives me the confidence? I'll just give you a couple of data points. Firstly, Coal India. Coal India released its progress for the six months to September 2015 on the weekend. Coal production in the first half was up 8.9%. That followed 6.9% the prior year, 400% higher than the five years prior than that. Energy Minister Goyal is in charge of Coal India. More importantly, though, dispatches in the month of September were up 15%. So that's an absolute record high. It's been increasing almost every month for 18 months in a row. So if you're looking... I'm not a coal booster, but what I would highlight, I look for evidence that when Energy Minister Goyal sets targets and sets objectives, is there evidence to say he's actually achieving goals? 15%, every single financial house in the world said there's no way he can do it. 18 months later, he just did it last week, last month. On a slightly more positive tack, global renewable energy leaders are moving rapidly into India. Now, that is absolutely critical because India's financial system is constrained and it requires global capital. It requires global technology and global leadership, management leadership. Global renewable energy players are bringing that to India rapidly. In July 2015, SoftBank of Japan and Foxconn of Taiwan, two of the most successful companies in Asia, both announced a joint $20 billion investment over five years into Indian solar. $20 billion, one announcement in solar. Last week, NL Green Power, one of the biggest players in Europe, one of the biggest utilities in Europe, acquired one of India's leading wind developers. Now, why is that relevant? It was only a 30 million euro investment. The reason it's relevant is that NL Green Power last week also articulated a plan to invest 9 billion euros in 7 gigawatts of renewable energy in the next five years in developing markets, including India and Brazil. NL thinks the transition's worth investing in. Adani, in 2015, has announced 16 billion US across eight landmark solar transactions. Adani is halfway today to building the world's largest solar project in the world. They only started it six months ago. It's the biggest solar project in the world, 648 megawatts of capacity, and it's 10 times bigger than any project that Adani's ever done in solar before. 10 times. Indian solar PPAs, power purchase agreements, are critically positive for part of Goyal's mission, which is a cost-effective solution. The power purchase agreements have zero inflation inbuilt into the power structure, the pricing structure for 25 years. In other words, energy deflation for 25 years. My last slide. Coal will be used for quite a while to come. However, equity markets are forward looking and they're now firmly telling us that the structural decline of coal is actually rapidly being priced in. Hopefully you're all aware of this chart, which is Peabody, the biggest producer of coal in the Western world, down 98% in five years, $17.5 billion of shareholder wealth destruction. But Martin yesterday mentioned the massive dislocation that VW brings, or will drive in the automotive industry. I'd actually say last week's events around Glencore, likewise, following on from what's happened to Peabody in the last five years, show that leverage, financial engineering, and a failure to actually acknowledge key business risk leads to an absolute train wreck. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'll, um, I'll kick off 
off with a, a few questions to the panel, and then I'll um, take questions from the audience. Uh, Volker, um, with this um, energy transition that you speak of in Europe, obviously they've had a stunning amount of growth in renewables, and you cited very large numbers of mon uh, amounts of money that need to be spent to transition to a new energy system. Could you talk a bit about what that system actually looks like, distinct from perhaps the centralised energy system that we've you know, had for the last century? Can you hear me? Okay. This, uh, this is a question which has the potential to be a 30-minute answer, but I, 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 I keep it brief. I, I guess the, uh, the, the first one is that, uh, in my view, is, and this is what you are seeing across the industry, where um, renewables um, um, has a much higher proportion than, than anywhere else. The, the centralised system with, with the, the full value chain um, is, is not just disrupted, um, but it's about to change. And, and I guess um, some of the uh, European players you did mention, Tim, uh, simply invest in, in two emerging uh, markets uh, uh, be because um, of prices going really uh, through the bottom uh, in Europe. Um, by the way, develop uh, offshore winds um, gets priced below 8% in these days now something which was 13% um, two years ago. So uh, it just tells you how much under pressure um, uh, utilities are. Therefore, it's inevitable that they um, were separate parts of, of their value chain. In other words, I, I see those who will specialize um, on development only and sell on them these assets um, to, to operators. Uh, we will see a world where um, the B2B business, um, so energy companies to large uh, industrial players, um, will be dominated by power purchasing agreements. Couldn't agree more with that uh, because it gives them the certainty, it gives them the long-term certainty on what the pricing is going, going to look like, and it's happening already uh, across Europe. And, and the second bit which is uh, about to change is, is the way how utilities uh, will have to um, uh, change um, in the B2C market. Uh, you know, most prominently uh, with uh, residential homeowners because these people will, you know, we, we know the, the, the very term of a prosumer, but um, they, they are becoming smart prosumers. So um, they now decide when to sell the electricity rather than simply increase um, their self-usage, uh, um, which is at the moment uh, um, the phenomena. In other words, these companies have to become more digital. And I, I did mention uh, this um, another opportunity uh, today. You see now that companies like Apple, um, Samsung, and Google are massively investing. Apple has just announced this, this home kit, uh, uh, home developers kit for smart um, home integration. That is something we, we will see more of and, um, and companies now simply have to decide whether they are more on the development and generation side of things or whether they become more like retailers. I think the race is open, Gemma, um, but the business model as we know it of a large central conglomerate uh, with, where uh, economies of scales are the, uh, the main driver of profitability, that's gone. Thank you. Um, a question for Fiona, and then I'll take questions from the floor. Um, which BHP's fossil fuel assets are, are likely to become stranded, and will BHP be divesting from those? And I ask that question in light of the IEA slide, which really focused on coal as being um, you know, the most impacted under a uh, climate accord scenario. Yeah, sure. Thanks for that, Gemma. Um, well, you've seen from the analysis that we provided this morning, also the documents here, that we see that the diversification of our portfolio, the low cost of our assets and the high quality actually minimises the risk of stranded assets for us. But I think you step back a bit from a global perspective. As Tim mentioned and the IA have highlighted, there's going to be an ongoing role for fossil fuels, so coal, oil and gas, for decades to come. And even in the, the IA's 450 scenario, you see 60% of the world's energy needs coming from fossil fuel in 2040. So, if you're going to limit climate change and provide access to affordable energy, you're going to have to do something to significantly improve energy efficiency, to reduce emissions from the use of fossil fuels, and also to support alternative energy sources like renewables and nuclear. All of those things have to be achieved. <coughs> Interestingly, when you think about the transition to that two-degree C world, what we see is that the cost of production 
and the quality of resources becomes increasingly important, increasingly important um, considerations when determining which fossil fuel reserves are actually brought to market. And what we see is there'll be greater demand for high quality, low cost assets like ours in comparison with higher cost, lower quality fossil fuels, which could be displaced from the market. So we would certainly encourage not just fossil fuel companies, but all companies to think about how the transition to a two degree C world could impact the resilience of their portfolio and make that information available to investors. Great, thank you. Um, questions from the audience? Yes. If you could just say your name and the organisation you work with. Uh, hello, I'm Lindsay Dennis from Climate Works Australia. I have a question for Fiona. Uh, first, thanks a lot for providing this information. I think it's great. Um, I was quite surprised by the small range that you uh, see in uh, some of the commodities demand, in particular iron ore and uh, metallurgical coal. Um, as you know, steel is a very emissions intensive uh, product and uh, contributing very significantly to global emissions. So it is uh, quite possible that uh, one of the most cost effective ways to reduce emissions from steel will be to increase significantly material efficiency. Uh, and this could have really dramatic uh, consequences on the demand for iron ore and metallurgical coal, especially if it's combined with an uh, increased rate of uh, recycling. Uh, so I was wondering if this is something that you have considered, especially that um, I saw that the analysis so that both those commodities could be uh, benefiting from climate change. Yeah, thanks, Amandine. And that comes back to the, the point I made before. It's about differentiating between the quality of resources and the cost of production. So in the case of both iron ore and metallurgical coal, we have very high quality assets and also very low cost of production on the cost curve for both of those commodities. So we see an ongoing demand for our resources in comparison with perhaps some other players. But you're right, there's going to be an ongoing demand for steel. There's also going to be an important um, transition in capturing the emissions from the production of steel. So for example, we would expect to see a more important role for CCS in industrial applications if you're going to continue to produce steel at the same sort of rate, using the same sort of technologies as we have today. Both of the uh, big assets that you mentioned, the Anglin, uh, Anglin Water and uh, Brisbane Airport, um, in terms of sort of warding off or guarding against um, the adaptation risks, you mentioned with the with the UK water experience that that um, that investment then turned out to not be not be required or kind of be unnecessary at least so far, um, and that then you know. You you do pose the question, well, then what will that mean when we want to discuss this sort of thing in future with government? Um, and, and then, like I was with Brisbane Airport, um, you know, how the airlines and in turn the passengers can feel about this costing 20% more. Um, I'm just curious uh, to hear a bit more about how that is actually articulated as a, as a, as a risk and a probability that um, this may. Uh, you know, it may not turn out to be um, an a, a investment that yields a uh, reward immediately, but you're not paying for that. You know, you're not paying under the assumption that it's definitely going to happen. You're paying uh, to to go against the probability of something happening. So I, I assume that that's something that is um, considered very carefully. And you did mention that you didn't have time to go into insurance, um, but when it's articulated that way, presumably. Um, partners and everyone else who's paying that cost would appreciate then that um, you're paying not for something that will definitely happen, but to reduce a whatever it might be, 5% or one in 10 year or one in 50 year chance that say the airport will become unusable for several days. Um, so just interested in, is that the framework in which those discussions take place? Or, or is, is, is there this sense of kind of rueful, oh, we've spent money on this and we didn't end up needing it and we could have spent it on something else? Because that seems a little short-sighted. Fortunately, we don't get blamed for that. So the government gets blamed for that. And you would have seen they had an article, I think it was today's or yesterday's newspaper, I lost track of which day it is, but um, on the desalinisation plan, it's basically saying you built these things, no one's ever used them, but half the people love them, half the people hate them, it's like politics. And they cost 
$10 million a year to have there, and they cost $720 million a year if you turn them on. So they're enormously expensive just to sit there, but they're incrementally expensive if you actually physically use them, so it seems a bit weird. And so that conversation is very hard for people to get their heads around, which is why you get half the people saying, what a waste of money. We need to build schools and hospitals and roads and public transport and all this other stuff. Why do we spend that money? It's taxpayers' money. That's just paying for that. So everyone on their water bill has a desalinisation charge. I'll give you another example as well. So we run an electricity distribution business in the UK. We have 99.96% availability, which sounds pretty good, but it means the lights go out occasionally for various reasons. And we have had over, it's been a long running conversation, we've had over 100 years, how long that distribution network's been there, a conversation with our customers about whether that 0.04% is worth mitigating. So do you want your lights on always? Because to get that last little bit will cost double what the network's currently worth. So obviously there's a point in time where customers go, no, nah, no, nah, it's okay, the lights go out. Just make sure they go out one with the app. Well, you know, they do. <laughs> so, so it's not just this that they're talking, they're having a conversation. This conversation happens a lot already in existing investments for a lot of different reasons, and that electricity one's a good example of that. You can spend an unlimited amount of money to make something not happen, but in reality, we don't necessarily care whether certain things happen or not to a certain degree, and we've got to value that. So all we need to do with this conversation is take it to that place. And I think, do people see desal as a useful investment? I don't think we'll have to wait long until everyone goes, what a great idea that was, fortunately. And I think it's happening now. I think Victoria's in for a shocking, apparently in for a shocking drought. And they'll turn it on. I think they're even talking about turning it on this year or next year. And so unfortunately, I think you need to be pushed to some of those extremes because they're rel relatively new paradigms in investment thinking. You need to be pushed to those extremes for people to understand the context of what they're doing. Will we always get that? No. I think people will always see the pipeline we built in the UK as a bit of waste of money. So sometimes we get it wrong. Um, but there are insurance policies, I guess. So whether we spend, this is what people don't see, we spend a lot of money insuring our private businesses. And that money is an operating expense that gets passed on to the users. So the customers, the taxpayers, the tolls, the tariffs. We already do that. It's just not as an explicit conversation. This is a more explicit conversation because people see it. They see the DSL plan. There's a lot of publicity around it, they don't, they don't come and ask us how much we're spending on insurance and why. Because we spend insurance to protect our returns, not to protect them necessarily. We build these out plans to protect them, so that they don't have to turn their hose pipes off. So it's a bit of a different conversation. And I guess it'll become more prevalent when insurance stops turning up. Because when the day we can't get insurance for something, we won't take that risk, we'll mitigate it out and the customers will have to pay for it. If we have insurance for a risk, we don't necessarily need to build the concrete and steel to stop that risk happening because we'll just go and claim it off the insurers if it happens. And we might get a bit of brand damage because the airport doesn't operate for a couple of hours or the water goes off for a couple of hours. Um, but a good example is United Utilities in the UK just had a crypto spreading uh, outbreak. It cost them 26 million bucks. And they didn't have insurance for it because you can't insure for it. So would they have built, will they now go and build a whole bunch of kit to stop that one thing that's happened. Now, it hasn't happened for 25 years, but it happened. Now will they go and spend a whole bunch of money or convince the regulator to let them spend a whole bunch of money to stop that happening again through you know, all the processing and putting in place to stop that? Absolutely. But did anyone get crypto for you? No. <laughs> it was just detected in the water. So I hope that's sort of long-winded way of answering your question. Oh, would you mind standing up? Uh, from Heta. Um, question for Volker and maybe to Mark as well. Um, I'm interested in the experience that you've seen um, in Europe in respect to the effect on uh, large-scale transmission of power because of the decentralisation that, that comes from home, solar generation, etc. So just wondering if you can give us any observations as to what you've seen in respect to utilisation spend, etc. Um, on the sort of the, the high power transmission stuff rather than the uh, rather than just distribution to the home. So there's a really good single quick example I can give before Bob gives you a proper smart answer. One of the distribution network operators in the UK has just claimed that they're full. So no more. They've said to the regulator, we can't accept any more distributed generation. So I hope that shocked everyone, because that's pretty shocking. And so now they start fighting with the regulator about how much they have to spend to open the network up again. Now our distribution business is getting full, 
but we're finding smarter and more innovative ways to get around that, and there are ways to do that. But an electricity system is quite unstable and quite a volatile system, and if you don't manage it and balance it right, it was very easy to do when the power was coming one way and flowing one way. Now it's flowing all over the shop. It's chaos. And so that, you know, is a really interesting situation for a network operator to say, no more thanks to a full, unless we go and spend billions. <laughs> I'm not sure how to respond to this, but let me just start to, uh, to answer the question. I, um, if you observe this as, as chaos, that's probably the difference we're looking from a financial perspective and from an engineering perspective. I think that's, that's what this business is all about. It's very complex, it's real time, uh, and it's managing uh, this, this sort of complexity. So, coming back to, to, to your point on uh, will, will there be large developments on, you know, you probably talk about long distance transports in, in particular. You know, my, my company was involved and still is to a very small extent now in, uh, in, in Desert Tech. You know, one of these, you know, some people argue small pipe dreams, um, um, effectively populating 1% of the Sahara deserts to uh, uh, fuel um, Europe with electricity. Um, and that was only viable if you have um, these sort of um, uh, transport um, uh, infrastructure, um, which, which we have tested. The, the, the short answer to, to your question is, it's too expensive. Um, you need um, technology um, which, um, first of all, uh, reduces um, the, uh, the uh, resistance, uh, something, you know, uh, the physicists between us or the engineers know that it, it, it grows exponentially uh, with the distance. Um, so you have to find different materials which are very expensive. Um, then you still have to do uh, a lot of cooling um, over distances. Um, we, we have just done uh, a mile uh, in, uh, in, in the city um, of, uh, of Düsseldorf and it was about 20 times more expensive uh, than underground cable, which by itself four times more expensive than uh, overhead lines. So, so I guess what I, what I would say is it's possible. Um, we need different forms of financing this. Um, if there was a reality check and a desert tech or something like desert tech was possible um, because I still believe um, that we will have to transport electricity over large distances uh, eventually um, then uh, more certainty in, in the regulatory environment of transport grids um, need, need to happen but that only happens if Europe for instance uh, would agree on a unified um, uh, grid code Simple answer is that's not happening at the moment. People feel, you know, the system becomes more decentral. Therefore, why would you bother to enhance a central infrastructure? But I wouldn't discount that yet. There are other uh, technologies I would uh, rather be more pessimistic not on that. Yeah. Yes. Can I uh, maybe elaborate on one point Mark made? Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that electricity markets take decades to transition. And probably no surprise, the UK actually is the fourth largest installer of solar from a standing start in the last 12 months. So to install three gigawatts of solar from nothing two years ago to three gigs a year, that's not consistent, stable, long-term policy, that's stop-start policy. So the chaos that Mark refers to is trying to adapt overnight to a long-term change. We need consistent long-term policy, we need a smart grid. The UK didn't have a smart grid, Australia doesn't have a smart grid. You've got to invest to actually transform. You don't do that overnight, otherwise you end up with Mark's word chaos. Thank you, Tim. We'll um, need to draw the session to a close, but um, it's been a very diverse landscape of, um, of conversation, and I'm sure the speakers will be available in the, the lunchtime break to take any more questions. So please join me in uh, thanking the panellists, and I hope you enjoyed the session. <laughs>